From the State House to the Interior Department, from Eldridge Cleaver to John Houseman to Jerry Falwell to William Agee, 1981 featured a lot of stories and a lot of personalities. I'm Mark Johnson. Following tonight's McNeil Lair, we'll take a look back at some of the stories we covered during 1981. Funding for the reporters is provided by Friends of Channel 4 Incorporated and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. From the State House to the Interior Department, from Eldridge Cleaver to John Houseman to Jerry Falwell to William Agee, 1981 featured a lot of stories and a lot of personalities. Good evening. Tonight, on the eve of the new year, we take a look back at some of the stories we covered on this broadcast during 1981, a year that saw us covering issues as diverse as the rabbit drive in eastern Idaho, the sale of silver from the strategic stockpile, the occasionally rancorous state legislative session that involved a lot of discussion of how to spend the state's money, and the dismay and then the lingering hope that the Bunker Hill mine in North Idaho could still be salvaged. So tonight, we take a quick glance back at some of the issues and the personalities that made news here during 1981. Uh, this, is a, this is a serious, uh, an economic problem as we have ever faced, uh, as I said, comparable to the Teton disaster. No story in 1981 drew quite the reaction or coverage, and deservingly so, than the decision to close the Bunker Hill mine and smelter in Kellogg. I'm going to sign this morning in the executive order creating the Silver Valley Economic Task Force. The governor's task force worked throughout September, October, and November in search of a buyer. When all hope was gone, it seemed, three businessmen, two of them from North Idaho, stepped forward to try and put together a financial salvage plan. At year's end, the group was still working on the plan. Idaho's congressional delegation tried to improve the chances of a Bunker Hill sale and ease a depressed silver market with a major effort to force the federal government to back off the sale of silver from the government silver stockpile. You know, I've learned a lot about silver in the last six months because of the issue of Bunker Hill uh, and the issue of this stockpile sale. I would not expect silver to rebound to the $11 or $12 figure because there are so many forces vying in the marketplace. A dollar, dollar and a half, very possibly. Uh, and the reason I say that uh, in, in the the atmosphere of that kind of market that is an international market. Uh, I was quoted one day in the Wall Street Journal as going to stop the silver stockpile sale and, and it jumped 25 cents an ounce that day. Now that's a, a fickled situation, but those who deal in that kind of commodity that are in and out of it, bidding on it, uh, react uh, in strange ways to certain kinds of activities around that market. Finally, by legislation, the sale was halted. The last few months of 1981 were tough ones indeed for Idaho's Silver Valley. As the year ends, fingers remain crossed that the famous mine in Kellogg might still be saved. Perhaps no politician made as much news in the West in 1981 as this man, Interior Secretary James Watt. He was praised and criticized from Sacramento to Denver for what he was doing at the Department of Interior. The petition drive is just a manifestation of opposition. It's not the limit of it. And I might point out that the petition drive is much broader than the Sierra Club, or opposition is much broader than the Sierra Club. It includes the entire spectrum of outdoor groups, uh, ranging from the National Wildlife Federation, which uh, kind of followed Watt's advice that they hang back six months and watch what he did, and they hung back and watched, and they came out in firm opposition to his policy. Has he diffused the Sagebrush Rebellion, Mr. Leroy? The Sagebrush Rebellion, in my opinion, has always been a far more complex set of issues than simply a land grab by certain Western interests or the thought that uh, on some hypothetical day all of the federal lands in the West would be turned over to the Western states. Because it is, in my opinion, such a complex issue, the answer is both yes and no. It's an accumulation of frustrations on various things, uh, like our Idaho Lou lands difficulty, uh, some of the problems that uh, ranchers had, uh, some of the problems that Western governors or Western public officials had in simply getting dialogue or, or being properly considered in the setting of federal policies. Uh, thus, I think some of his early initiatives have been very productive, but there remains a body of frustrations, a substantial uh, number of issues that still must be adjusted, despite best intentions early shown. 
Now, I have made some pro-development decisions, and I f the reason for that is that I found the pendulum of decision-making way out in left field when I took the department over. And to bring that pendulum down into the main mainstream of, of American environmental movement takes some moving towards the middle, and I've done that, and some of the special interest groups who favored having it out in left field don't like that, of course. The first three months of 1981 were dominated by the efforts of the state legislature to control the state's budget. The session, with Republican lawmakers firmly in control, was nonetheless occasionally rancorous. Here's some fairly typical debate, this coming from the last day of the 1981 session. The subject, how much to pay state employees and how many employees would lose their jobs. I want to point out, of course, that uh, that, that uh, was not fully funded and as a result of that, there are going to be uh, uh, more vacancies or, or less people working for state government. It's hoped that uh, most of these will be picked up by attrition. I would expect that most of the loss will be picked up by attrition. I think it's a fair increase. As I said, when we passed the original resolution, that, of course, had some ties to it, uh, which did not come to pass. Nonetheless, I felt it was a uh, fair increase at that point. I feel it's a fair increase at this point. I'd urge your affirmative vote. Thank you, Mr. President. Is there further debate? But, uh, we would have supported uh, a higher increase for state employees' pay. Uh, however, the hour being late and the day being long here, I think this is about the best we're going to get for state employees. Next year, I would hope that the majority party would work with the minority in trying to come to an early solution to the state employees' pay issue. It seems like every year, this issue is a political football, and it's always decided, almost always decided on the last legislative day. And I don't think it has to be that. I think reasonable people and reasonable minds, all people being involved in the decision, can come to a fair and equitable solution. And that includes the members of this body, as well as those across the rotunda, and the gentleman on the second floor. The legislature also struggled in 1981 with reapportionment. Decided was a redistricting plan. After a veto, left until 1982, the redrawing of legislative district boundaries. The Western governors met in September at Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and there they talked a lot about money as well. As producer Gene McNeil explained at the time, they were concerned about what Ronald Reagan was doing to their state budgets. Well, I think at the point when the combined federal action and the lack of revenues at the state make it impossible to maintain vital programs, then you have to raise the revenues at the state level to keep those programs alive. And that's a politically difficult situation for the state. Oh, surely it is. It, uh, uh, the new federalism in the long run implies that, that the federal government will get out of things and pass a taxing source to the states to use. In the short term, the feds are cutting, uh, saving taxes, and they have not made that taxing source available to the states, and people don't understand that you can't get something for nothing. While most Western governors have reservations about the budget cuts, Democrats are, understandably, more outspoken in their criticism. Utah's Scott Matheson lays much of the blame for what he calls thoughtless slashing on Reagan budget director David Stockman. That uh, Mr. Stockman uh, is uh, very glib about uh, using figures. Uh, he uh, seems to uh, fail, however, when it comes to a rational basis upon which cuts should be made. It is not appropriate to continue to slash and slash and slash without taking the time to decide where important priorities lie with respect to programs. And until he learns that, I do not believe that we are going to end up with any satisfactory uh, budgeting uh, results. And uh, the figures that he is looking at in terms of additional cuts are also very dramatic. So, yes, I'm very concerned. In December, Governor John Evans delivered his 1982 state budget. We have not had a general tax increase to finance state government since I took office as governor and I will not recommend a tax increase now. Republicans were critical of the budget for what they called the funny money proposals it contained. Such disagreement left open the real possibility of even more tough budget sledding in the 1982 state legislature. By the end of the year, a recession-plagued economy began to dominate the news, and mounting federal deficits became not only an economic but a political problem. Uh, the president uh, 
won, I think, on a, an economic recovery act. An important political issue for Republicans. Yes, and he, uh, he set a balanced budget in 1984, and I think people believed him, and they voted for him. And then David Stockman came out with his, uh, his uh, interview, and I think that was a major blunder. And then uh, the Council of Economic Advisors all of a sudden say deficits aren't a problem. And I think it's a question of credibility. Uh, there are people saying things in the administration that uh, I think uh, a lot of questions being raised. And so there's a lot of political damage that may result in a House of Representatives uh, change in, in, in mix in next year and later the Senate. Uh, it, the damage may be enough now that uh, the President could lose control of the Senate uh, in the next two years. Uh, Dean McClellan, I have just about 15 seconds left. Do you see this credibility problem that uh, both of these gentlemen talked about? You bet, in spades. Uh, when Republicans are running naked through the streets of Washington saying deficits are good for you, uh, I've got credibility problems. State energy plan was unveiled in December at a series of public hearings around the state. The plan's major emphasis was on conservation and renewable resources. Critics said it was lacking for not taking a strong pro-nuclear stand. The policy stated in the Idaho State Energy Plan continues the recent past years of millions being spent on studies, evaluations, and ever-increasing regulation, while nuclear, the energy option that was the cheapest and most available, becomes less available and much more expensive. An Idahoan, Peter Johnson, took charge at the Bonneville Power Administration in 1981, and the role of BPA became more significant in Idaho. Is this process working as, uh, as it was designed to work, or is it too early to tell? It's a little too early to tell, Mark. Uh, we, uh, the law, uh, there are two lawsuits that have been uh, already filed against the contracts that have been offered by Bonneville. I signed 500 contracts uh, uh, late in August, just before the 1st of September, that were delivered to uh, utilities, public, private industries throughout the region. And uh, two lawsuits have been, have been filed up to this date, and there may be more. An aggressive Idaho Public Utilities Commission and its chairman, Perry Swisher, continued to make news throughout 1981. The commission changed the electric rate structure of Idaho Power Company, a decision the company in part is appealing. That so-called inverted rate decision prompted a legislative examination of the PUC's rate-making powers. <clears throat> Pacific Power and Light flew its people into Boise this fall to ask us to please invert their rates. Puget Sound, Portland General. Now those are the only other private hydro companies uh, in the region. All of their rates have been inverted with no fuss. This is not a political issue in Northern Idaho. There's nobody from Northern <coughs> Idaho on this committee. This is not a political issue over there on the UPNL. Mel Hammond didn't make it to the meeting today. A Rexburg legislator. Well, UPNL rates are flat because they're thermal. It's not a hydro So this company. is an Idaho Power Company service area political Absolutely. issue. Absolutely. Senator Swenson, what do you say to that? Well, I, I presume that it is an issue because I have, uh, I have read and I have heard on the news where the uh, Idaho Power Company uh, felt that it uh, was an unjust action by the PUC <coughs> because they had made commitments to... Uh, residential users of electricity when they put in uh, electrical place heating, uh, that they feel uh, the, uh, this decision has caused them to break uh, faith with their customers. Commissioner, what about all this talk about social engineering? Are you in that business? Yes, sir. <clears throat> in what way? We set rates. Late in the year, federal judge Marion Callister dealt a stunning blow to Equal Rights Amendment supporters when he ruled that states could rescind their ratification of the proposed amendment and that Congress had acted illegally in extending the deadline for ratification. Earlier in the year, the case drew National Organization for Women President Eleanor Schmeel to Idaho, now had unsuccessfully sought the removal of Judge Callister from the controversial case. The 19th Amendment, and how quickly we do forget, took us from 1848 to 1920 to ratify. That was the woman's right to vote. Uh, my, uh, the feminist movement, which uh, really was born in the, in the suffrage movement, uh, we know how hard it is to change things for females. 
Uh, so we're not faint-hearted. The amendment for equal rights for women politically and, and is taken from 1923 when it was introduced by the suffragists to now. Uh, it doesn't mean it's a bad idea. As a matter of fact, some of the greatest ideas for human re rights in our society have taken the longest time because they're profound. At issue was the process between the Congress and the several states of amending our Constitution itself. Because the judge was careful and clear and concise in spelling out how the Congress must relate to the states when it submits to the states a proposal for amendment, uh, the role of the states and the responsibility of the states in that process has been strengthened. It's also being said today that it is a great defeat for women's rights. Is it that? Well, obviously, this decision uh, and the case incidentally focused on the, the basic constitutional rights of our legislature in this process rather than the particular merits or demerits of the proposed 27th Amendment. But obviously, this ruling uh, does nothing to advance the cause of proponents of that amendment. Politically, at the state level, the campaigns for election in 1982 began earlier than ever. Democratic Governor John Evans, a candidate in all but declaration, had a firm hold on his party's renomination. Republican Lieutenant Governor Phil Batt became the first Republican candidate to announce for governor. At year's end, Batt was generally thought to be the GOP frontrunner. House Speaker Ralph Olmsted of Twin Falls is in the Republican race, as is CUNA Farmer and Medal of Honor winner Bernie Fisher. Lewiston Democratic State Senator Mike Mitchell was the only announced candidate for Lieutenant Governor in 1981. There's already a two-way race shaping up for the Republican Attorney General's nod. The race for mayor of Boise, a five-way contest, was watched with interest all over the state. Two-term incumbent Dick Erdley won the election, a surprisingly large margin as it turned out, over former state law enforcement director Kelly Pierce. Many thought the election would turn on the 17-year-long battle to redevelop downtown Boise. That was an issue, but so was Erdley's leadership. Everything my opponents have advocated in this campaign would lead to just one end result. The major retail center would go to the suburbs, along with the other business and development that would follow it. That's what the people of Boise have repeatedly said they don't want to happen here. That was the key point in the citizens' concept plan put together by citizens themselves in the early 70s. That's been the key point in every other plan drafted in this area in the last 10 years. Sewer plans, road and street plans, transit plans, growth plans. <coughs> All have been geared to maintaining downtown as the major retail area in the city and holding urban sprawl and the higher public service costs that go with it. Robert Hansberger, a local partner in the Downtown Redevelopment Consortium, was frequently in the news in 1981. Here, defending the controversial move of his company and other developers to buy the downtown shopping center site from the Boise Redevelopment Agency. Mr. Hansberger, are you in any way concerned about the, uh, the initial or even the long-term public reaction to this sale and some of the questions that have been raised about it, the validity of those questions aside? Are you concerned about sort of a, the feeling on the street out there? I am uh, I'm not uh, concerned at all about the validity of the questions I am concerned, uh, very interested in, uh, concerned about the misinformation that... Uh, there is about the project. Uh, all through its uh, life, uh, the project has had the problem of being a very visible project, uh, as well it would be in the heart of uh, our downtown, uh, and involving uh, the use of public uh, funds. Uh, but the negotiations are essentially private negotiations, uh, the negotiations which have to go on with uh, major retail department stores. It's very, very difficult to combine the world of a public project and very complex, very private negotiations. And there are times when uh, some of the very uh, minor, very complex details are, are not properly served by being uh, involved in gold, goldfish bowl negotiations. Idaho's longtime congressional voice on foreign affairs, Frank Church, although no longer in the Senate, continued to speak out on the new administration's foreign policy. This administration is overly obsessed, overly impressed with the Soviet Union, much more so than uh, our own allies and uh, most of the other nations of the world whose leaders are not nearly uh, so mesmerized uh, by uh, the Kremlin. With new seniority, Idaho's new senior senator, Republican Jim McClure, 
played a key role in the Senate's approval of the AWACS and F-15 enhancement sale to the Saudi Arabians. And so, uh, yes, we have to be concerned. I think we are concerned about uh, giving F-15s or 16s to any of the countries in the region. Uh, we're concerned about uh, the sale of tanks and other uh, uh, military equipment as well to any of the countries and worried about where they may be aimed next. But I don't believe that that can chase us out of the area. I don't think that fear is reason for us to simply surrender and let somebody else have the entire area. I think their stakes are too high and they're too important to us. The turmoil in Poland brought a dozen Polish refugees to Idaho in December. Considering the strength developed over the last year of solidarity, is it possible that solidarity can be broken by this imposition of martial law? Tak moc ile ta solidarność ma teraz, czy to co się dzieje tam może to złamać? Ja nie wierzę w to i nie wierzę w to, żeby ich złamać. Ludzie są bardzo silni. Polacy są tak zahartowani w czasie dziejów. Rozbiory, długa wojna światowa. Niemcy chcieli nas zniszczyć i nikt nie zniszczyli. Tak samo Solidarność jest najzdrowszą. Ten zdrowy trzon Solidarności jest bardzo wielką siłą. They don't believe that the martial law will break down the solidarity because the Polish people are so united that they will win out no matter what. And former Iranian hostage William Belk visited the state and was critical of Congressman George Hansen's visits to Iran during the hostage crisis. I didn't see any, any need in anyone coming to Iran giving us false hope about uh, I will call your family and I will do this and I will do that and uh, only to find, we find out later that uh, no one was called, not one family that I know of uh, uh, was called. Uh, Congressman Hansen said he would, he would he see the calling. He said family. that he would, uh, he would call my wife and uh, the strange thing about it, he didn't even ask my name. Not once did he ask anyone's name. He didn't see everyone that was there even. So how did he know who to call? Did he see you? He saw me, yes. Yeah. And he's a, 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 a nice gentleman, but uh, I don't see where uh, his telling me he's going to call my family and then doesn't do it uh, served any purpose. I stayed there still 14 months, so why did he come? We talked during 1981 to numerous other provocative personalities. Former Black Panther leader Eldridge Cleaver. Have you changed that much from the Eldridge Cleaver that people saw in pages, front pages of American newspapers in the 1960s? Well, I prefer to say that I've uh, gotten older and a little wiser as a result of my subsequent experiences and particularly my travels and stays and studies in communist countries. What, how, do you, uh, how do you describe uh, what older and wiser has, uh, has brought you? Well, I think that uh, during the 1960s we were uh, very passionately uh, focused in on some very specific grievances. Uh, we were trying to stop the war in Indochina and we were campaigning for a change in the status of black people in America. We were doing this under the banner of uh, Marxism-Leninism. The Black Panther Party had taken Marxist uh, philosophy as the ideology of the party. And so when I left the United States, I went to Cuba. I lived in Algeria, had a chance to travel to the Soviet Union and. Czechoslovakia, Poland, East Germany, North Korea, China, North Vietnam. In all of these places that I would travel to, I would study how communism was organized in those countries, how the people related to the regime, and just what was the basic relationship, and to find out some clues that we could use back here in America. Well, the more I looked at these governments and societies, the less I liked them. Bendix Corporation Chairman William Agee. Uh, antitrust laws uh, that we have today in this country are geared to a domestic market and geared to a time that existed in the late uh, teens and the 20s and 30s. They, they have no applicability today where, as Ted indicates, we're, we're serving world markets. So I'm an advocate of dramatic revisions and in some cases eliminations of certain aspects of antitrust laws along with reduction in many of the unreasonable regulations that exist today. 
Federal District Judge Ray McNichols, taking on senior status during 1981, talked about the problems of too many prisoners and not enough prisons. I think the society is prepared to spend the money necessary to build the prisons and the penitentiaries to house. Well, they haven't wanted to in the past, uh, and uh, it's taken so long to build usually. For instance, in our own state and in our own county here, uh, we, we see a this new fine jail facility built for Ada County that's uh, overcrowded. We have a brand new penitentiary that's overcrowded. Uh, the thing is, it's, it's the, the, these prisoners have no uh, constituency, and it's, it's a slow process to get the kind of money that's needed these days for penitentiaries, and so uh, I, I think it'll be a slow process. Jerry Falwell held a moral majority rally on the State House steps. Oh, I'm just a flag waving American, folks. A citizen I'm really proud to be. Oh, Falwell and the Liberty Baptist Choir from Lynchburg, Virginia, have held I Love America rallies now on 41 state capitol steps to reinforce their ideas of morality, religion, and politics in local communities. I'm glad we have a president, I'm glad we have leadership in Washington today that agrees with that point of view and that is working very hard against difficult odds. And by the way, we need, we need to pray for our president. There are those cooks in our society who'd like to destroy him, and our God is able and big enough to keep him alive, but we need to wrap him up in prayer. Among the 800 or so people attending this morning's rally were about 250 members of a group calling themselves the Idaho Immoral Minority. Steve Jennings, a spokesman for the group, said it wants to remind the moral majority that minorities also have rights. Well, what we've heard is the, what I call the Constitution according to Falwell. He, he's uh, slick enough that, he, that it's, it's hard to pin him down uh, on any particular thing, but if you, if you, if you pick up on the, the tone and the emphasis, he seems to be uh, outlining a, a plan where uh, everyone in the country will be uh, the same. There'll be no room for diversity. Uh, the Bill of Rights protects the rights of minorities and people who aren't in the, aren't finally, in the majority and uh, the church. there's no way that he can turn the clock, clock back on the Bill of Rights. And the paper chases Professor Kingsfield, John Houseman, told us stories of his amazing career. Mr. Houseman, there uh, apparently in the, the literature of Hollywood these days is a, is a uh, proliferation of expose books, uh, uh, Christina Crawford's book, um, um, Shelley Winters has a new book uh, that purports to tell all the inside story of Hollywood. Uh, how do you feel about that sort of thing? Well, uh, I don't think that, but to begin with, uh, it's all history because that Hollywood is not there anymore. It's gone. The, the world has, you know, has moved on. Um, Shelley's books are all, and I think they're rather endearing. They're all about who, who she slept with and, and uh, that's fine if she wants to tell. Most of it is only partially true, but it's entertaining. And if she wants to do that, that's, I have no objection to that. I rather enjoyed her first book. I'm Mark Johnson. Good night and Happy New Year. This program is produced by KAID-TV, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for the reporters is provided by Friends of Channel 4 Incorporated and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.